Hi guys, it's me, Chazar HD, and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we're going to be looking at a different topic than usual. Usually we go for a preview for the next race. We will be talking about that later on. But the main topic of today, or the main two topics, are one, looking at and exposing the FIA's uh, bad decisions and inconsistency. But also we're going to give you a tech update for the past couple races for teams like Ferrari, Red Bull, Renault and other teams uh, in the midfield. And again, we will get on to talking about Singapore and what we think uh, going into the Singapore Grand Prix later on. I will inform you guys later on in the podcast what I will be doing for previews uh, for the next couple races. But of course, with me today is Nib. And Nib, how are you doing, mate? And uh, are you looking forward to uh, getting into a very hotly debated uh, topic, which again is FIA decisions? Uh, yeah, well, we'll start off with I'm I'm doing well on what is a very early Saturday morning here. We're pre-recording this, sadly, as we can't do it live again. I hope that we're able to do our, one of the a live podcasts soon because I do love interacting with you guys live in the chat. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm good and um, I'm certainly looking forward to this a little bit different podcast. Yep, it is definitely a different podcast and we will get into it so. Let's go to Canada. Now, in the first five or six races, the FIA, in terms of decision making, I thought they were fine. They 90% of the time were coming to the right decisions or what, you know, most of us thought was the right decisions. But then when we came to Canada and we had the whole Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton incident where the FIA, in my opinion and in Nib's opinion, wrongly punished Sebastian Vettel for forcing Hamilton off the track and re-entering in a uh, dangerous manner. That did open a can of worms from then for the rest of the season because after Canada, every decision has been looked upon in a much different way because of what happened in Canada. Because the FIA, I think, as we'll you know see later on, they know that with this incident, they did open a can of worms and that they did mess up with this uh, penalty that they gave out. So let's go into the incidents after Canada and look at, say, the inconsistency or the hypocrisy of the decisions being made. So if we first go to the next race on the calendar, which was Paul Ricard. Daniel Ricciardo, of course, got a penalty late on for, I think, first going off the track and then rejoining and pushing Norris off. And then, of course, he passed Raikkonen off the circuit. Now, I think, Nib, you said this to me, didn't you, that Ricciardo uh, did the same thing earlier to Roman Grosjean in the race. I know it'll be hard to remember because this race is a race we want to wipe from you know history it was so bad in terms of actual racing but um yeah early in the race isn't that true Niv that Ricardo did the same thing but didn't get a penalty um yes well that is quite some time ago it almost feels like it was a whole entire different season that uh, the races <laughs> have been so good since then but yeah it did look like that Ricardo actually overtook Grosjean off circuit we didn't actually have the proper on board if memory serves me correct of um to see if Ricardo's wheels were off the track but yeah I I disagreed with with the penalty that's for sure but it, it did look like that Ricardo had certainly most of his car off the track when he went around the outside of Grosjean Yes, so, and by the way, the reason I'm not showing it on the screen, that Ricardo Grosjean thing, is because we didn't at the time, and we still haven't seen a good enough angle of Ricardo's car, like we can here with when he pushed uh, Norris off the circuit, we didn't get a good enough angle to show um, that Ricardo went off the circuit, because again, the FIA's camera work that day was really poor, as it has been, um, well, not the FIA, but FOM, it's, their camera work has been very poor, in 2019 so that's the first real inconsistency because if this is a penalty late on then why wasn't the earlier incident between ricardo and groge on a penalty when it was a very similar incident in the same part of the track and then we came to austria where at the end of the race of course max verstappen went for the move on charles leclerc um, and charles leclerc of course went off the circuit now I have debated this with some people and I will say again and you can go back and look at the evidence and I think the evidence will back me up that the reason Leclerc went off circuit was because um, he turned in 
as you can see on this picture right now, they're both turning right for the right-hander, and Leclerc actually hits or clips Max Verstappen's front tyre, which causes Leclerc to go off the circuit. But if we go back to, say, Canada with this incident, you'll remember, guys, we analysed, you know, Sebastian Vettel's steering movement and what he could or couldn't be able to do. And I said that Sebastian Vettel, yes, he did enter, you know, the track where he did at that point, but he couldn't really do anything about it at all. But the FIA still punished him. Now, for Max Verstappen, of course, he did aggressively go down the inside at turn two or turn three, whatever it is, um, at Austria. And you can see on this steering wheel or this onboard off his steering wheel that he's turning fully right. But again, if we go back to Canada, again, the FIA failed in Canada to see or to sympathize with Sebastian Vettel what he could or could not do when it came to you know forcing a driver off the track or being dangerous when it came to racing and I remember you Nib at the time said that and this was before the penalty was not given later on for Max Verstappen I remember you saying that if Vettel gets penalized um, in Canada for what he did then Max Verstappen is probably going to be penalized in Austria and of course, he wasn't. Do you think the FIA was a bit inconsistent there? Again, considering that, what, two races before they penalised Vettel for... I wouldn't quite say the same thing, but it was a very close, you know, incident for the lead of a race, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, certainly, I agree. There was certainly some inconsistency between those two decisions there with Vettel's penalty in Canada and then Verstappen not getting the penalty in Austria. But ultimately, I think it was the right decision by the FAA. And I think, and I said this um, when we talked about the Vettel penalty afterwards and maybe on another time, but the reason why we often have so many inconsistencies is because of the actual stewards selected for each weekend because they're not the same stewards. It's like, say, with judging in boxing or mixed martial arts, you know, so different judges are going to see incidents differently and we're not always going to come to the same conclusion or result. And that's what happens um, in motorsports, what happens with the stewards decision in stewards decision in MotoGP in formula one in, in every category of motorsport and any sort of thing where there has, there is stewards or judges. And um, yes, they, they were certainly inconsistent on that. Um, but ultimately I think they did make the right decision by not penalising Verstappen. Um, you know, who knows if there was maybe some gravel or some grass on the outside. Leclerc maybe might not have chosen to then go off circuit. Obviously, Max defended pretty hard, but I think that Leclerc could have avoided going off circuit. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that they ultimately, the FIA, made the right decision by not penalising Verstappen. I will agree with that. And I need, I think I need to make this clear before we go any further is... You know, our opinion on these two incidents, the Canadian one and the Austrian one, we, and me and Nib, both do not think that they were penalties, but we are going by, you know, what the FIA say. And I will say that is an issue with, um, as you said, Nib, with um, the stewards, and it is the case around motorsport that different stewards are picked for race um, by race by race. Um, do you think that's a problem? I think, honestly, they should try to keep people in the decision making process a bit more you know they should keep the same people in there maybe not the entire same people you know in the stewards office you know when they're watching a race but if they're gonna have consistency of decisions surely don't you think Nib, they should have consistency of people being there who have been there you know race by race by race yeah, I think there should be a, a smaller rotation of the stewards because, of course, for some races they have guest stewards. You know, sometimes, who knows, they might have Nigel Mansell as, as a guest steward. Um, so when they have sort of guest stewards, they really sort of... Um, obviously, most of them are quite experienced, but some of them do make the wrong decision. And I think that perhaps they should be looking to cut down that sort of rotation and not have as many actual stewards um, be in that rotation. Maybe cut it down to, say, about 
five or six who are different stewards throughout the whole entire um, year. Obviously, you have your, your main set of stewards, and then you have one rotating in each race. I think that that would be a much better um, way to manage it, and I think it, we would see a lot more consistent um, penalties being handed out by the stewards. I'm not entirely sure, actually, how many stewards there are for a, for a Grand Prix weekend. I think is it is it three? I think I think it's three or four. To my memory, it's three or four. But yeah, I think ultimately that they should um, that they should. I'm just looking now. The current F1 stewards, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 21 different F1 stewards. And, well, I think <laughs> if you ask me, that is way too many. And the only person that I pretty much recognize off by, by name here is Mika Salo um, mm. and Gary Connolly. I think those are the only ones here that I realise. But, you know, I think that that, that that sort of needs to be cut down. You know, I think that that's way too many. And it's very clear to see why there are so many inconsistencies when it comes to, you know, a race-by-race -race scenario. Exactly. And I think maybe not, again, have every race have the exact same people making the decision. But if you had more of the same people then you would get to a more consistent giving out of penalties and stuff like that but we shouldn't have as you said that many we cannot have a constant rotation because if one person makes a stupid decision as a part of the stewards one weekend if the person replacing for the next weekend wouldn't do the same thing if it happened again at that next weekend then that is where you do get the inconsistency but it is now time to get on to the Italian Grand Prix weekend where there were so many, in my opinion, poor decisions. So, first off, we have the debacle in qualifying uh, for the Formula 1 cars, of course, at the end of qualifying where you had drivers backing each other up, uh, trying to get a toe, of course. But it was, it was farcical, it was ridiculous. I know some people found it funny, but from a competition standpoint, it's not funny at all. And... It was, I think, at times actually a bit dangerous because if you accelerate quickly in a Formula 1 car and the car ahead suddenly stops because he wants to you know, be behind you or stop you from overtaking, it can be very, very dangerous. Now, the stewards investigated, I think, what was it, Lance Stroll, Carlos Sainz and Nico Hülkenberg, who I think were the three main culprits of why this occurred. All three of them got away with a reprimand. In my opinion, that was too weak because if we go on to this, which is the F3 qualifying. Now, I know this is a much more extreme example because there's more cars in F3. There's not a Q1, Q2 and Q3 knockout system. So there's always going to be at the end 30 cars on circuit if you know there are still 30 cars available to do the end of qualifying. But in my opinion... Blocking someone on an outlap that could affect them getting round in time to make the flag is, in my opinion, the same as blocking someone who is on a lap. Because at the end of the day, you are blocking someone's ability to, one, do a lap, but to actually, you know, improve their lap also. You know, the, the, they are, for me, the same thing because you're still affecting their qualifying run at that point in time. Now... I think 15 of the drivers, I think, got a penalty in F3 for doing what they were doing here, which was similar to what the F1 drivers of Sainz, Hülkenberg and Stroll were doing. Why Carlos Sainz, Nico Hülkenberg and Lance Stroll did not get a penalty for me is, is unbelievable because they were blocking, even though Carlos Sainz made it round, he was not as bad, I think, as Hülkenberg um, was or, say, Stroll was, but... They were blocking people's ability to get round and do a lap. Yes, the teams were at fault for not sending them out in time. But those drivers, to send a message, they really should have punished them to say, when we come to a circuit where a toe is important, you cannot just back drivers up because you want to get a toe. You've got to get on with it or else you will be punished. Nib, 
Um, do you agree? And do you know? Do you think they, these drivers sh uh, should have been punished? I think they honestly bottled it. Um, well, I think that certainly Nico Hulkenberg and Lance Stroll should have been punished because Nico Hulkenberg had absolutely no intentions of going, uh, of actually taking the first chicane. You know, at least on the first run in Q3, Vettel, although I don't, I think that he actually did want to make it. Even if he wasn't trying to make the chicane, he made it believable by actually locking up and then going through and then being able to get, um, being able to potentially get a toe. Whereas Hulkenberg didn't even lock up. He just went straight on <laughs> and then Stroll's like, oh no, I'm not having any of that. He just waited. So also, like, of course, Stroll would have, um, would have been massively disadvantaged by not having the toe of Nico Hulkenberg and towing others around. But by doing that and by, and then I watched his, um, his post qualifying interview. He's like, I wasn't falling for that. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> You've got to cooperate with every other driver out there. Obviously, Hulkenberg didn't do a great job at doing that either, but so did, Stroll has to do the same as well. You know, he he should have absolutely just c continued and got on with it. And I think this has been suggested by um, quite a few people. They need to they need to put a minimum um, outlap time yeah. on. Um, obviously, depending on each track, because you know you can't just say right, it's two minutes maximum outlap for every single track because of course at monaco that would be ridiculous um or say it's at um at spa you know you got to pretty much go go at full speed to get across the line so obviously they've got to set a reasonable um you know maximum outlap time that they can do um and, and i think it just makes a lot of sense and i'm sure the fia will eventually get on top of this but um just touching on how apps how just what a joke of it, it was you know qualifying for many people is is the best part of the whole entire weekend it's the most exciting it's the most exhilarating and you know it's when you get to see these f1 cars which are truly magic to see in to the naked eye at, at their absolute maximum speed and just seeing them give it give it everything and for the fans who have paid all of that money for um all the italian fans out there and of course um you know, other people from other countries who travelled to the Italian Grand Prix to watch qualifying, you know, they've been robbed of what is a great show when in Q3. So it's it's really disappointing that the fans got to miss out on what would have been a great end because, of course, it was very close for pole between the Mercedes and, and Leclerc. I wouldn't say Vettel so much. As Vettel actually did miss out on the toe on the first run, so Vettel might have been closer in, this, in the second one, but that, obviously that doesn't matter. They were... Miss, they were um, they missed what is a great show. So it was totally unacceptable. And how um, Hulkenberg and Stroll didn't get penalties is uh, still quite beyond me. Yeah, it is. I was adamant that at least a couple of them should have got a penalty because it was ridiculous. And as you said, we don't get to see that often Formula One cars at their absolute best. The only time you really get to see it is in the final two runs of qualifying. And we didn't really get that. So, yeah, it completely ruined the show. And it made a mockery of Formula 1, in my opinion. And those drivers should have been punished. The FIA, in my opinion, bottled that decision. Also, let's talk about the Valtteri Bottas red flag situation. Now, Valtteri Bottas completed his only lap in qualifying whilst the red flag had come out now it did come out just before i believe he came to the line but nib am i correct in saying that on the steering wheel they're told immediately if there is a yellow or red flag in their sector is that true um i believe that is true and if not um the the teams get a little pre-message of a red flag or a yellow flag being deployed so the, they would have been told that information um prior to actually us seeing the red flag Exactly. So if Valtteri, say, has got that red flag message come up on his um, steering wheel and he can see, you know, the red flash on his steering wheel, then I'm sorry, Valtteri Bottas should not have been allowed to keep his lap because he has completed a lap after the red flag has come out. Now, I know 
you can say, oh, well, it only just come out and he was basically about to go across the line anyway. But, you know, Formula One in terms of the timing systems is very, very computerized. That it shouldn't, you know, this is not the 1970s where it wasn't really computerized and you could give people the benefit of the doubt because we didn't have TV cameras and we, you know, we didn't quite know, um, you know, what we can now in terms of where cars are on circuit and stuff like that. But nowadays with how computerized the timing systems are, if a driver completes or crosses the line after a red flag comes out, that time should not be counted. It, it absolutely should not. And the FIA's explanation after qualifying was they allowed Valtteri's lap time because they had to let the teams know. Well, I'm sorry, but again, it's a, the lap times in Formula 1 right now are incredibly computerised. They would have been able to tell if Valtteri had crossed the line before or after a red flag came out. And as far as I'm concerned, if the red flag warning system had come up on his um, dash and Valtteri had possibly caught a glimpse of it before he crosses a line, his, his lap time should be took away. There is, there is no doubt about that whatsoever. And I think that the FIA, when they came out and said that they you know, allowed his time because they had to let the teams know, I don't necessarily think that's a role. I think they kind of you know, made that up on the fly so they got out of trouble there because I don't think they could really explain you know, why they even let Valtteri Bottas keep um, that lap. Now, let's go on. And I know this picture is very grainy, but we're going to show Sebastian Vettel's off-track moment at the exit of the Parabolica on his first run in Q3, the first and only qualifying run he actually got in. Now, the FIA allowed this time to stand because they gave him the benefit of the doubt. But I have here evidence, in my opinion, that he was off the circuit officially. So you can see there the rear tyre is off the circuit. He's beyond the white lines. And if we come across to the front, you can see there he is just about, it is close, but he is all four wheels over the white lines. I don't care about if you're just over the white lines. If you go all four wheels over the white lines at, you know, at a particular corner where you know you can gain time by doing that, your lap time should be deleted. There is no excuses about that whatsoever. And how they allowed that when they disallowed, what was it, Roman Grosjean's lap, I think, in practice three, maybe Magnussen's in qualifying and also Alexander Albon's in qualifying. How they, you know, disallowed their laps for obviously going off the circuit and they didn't disallow this when there was physical proof that Sebastian Vettel did, even if it was for a millisecond, go off the circuit. I, I don't get why they did that. I, I really don't understand, you know, why they allowed that. It was clear to see once you actually, you know, freeze the frame and take a look at it. And the final thing that I think the FIA did get wrong, and I think Nib disagrees with me, and I'll let him uh, explain why, um, is the whole Leclerc-Hamilton thing. And for me, Leclerc de uh, did deserve to get a penalty because he came across on Hamilton and did crowd Hamilton off the circuit. And in my opinion did not give Lewis Hamilton a car's width when he did deserve one because Lewis had at least half of his car alongside. I will say again, because I know people disagree with me, but I will say again, it's my opinion, and I think, you know what, it's not that incorrect. If this happens at a different circuit where there is not, you know, a Tafosi, I don't believe Charles Leclerc comes away um, with the same punishment, which was what a blackened uh, white flag. I don't believe that would happen if, say in Singapore, Leclerc did the same thing to Hamilton on the entry to turn one. I don't believe that the same thing would happen because I don't believe the FIA are consistent and strong enough to do that. And I do think, as in Austria, that the fans at the circuit absolutely play a role in the decision-making 
of a governing body. That's been proven, I think, in football as well, that fans do actually make a difference in the decision making from, say, a referee or a you know governing body. Um, if you know they're actually at the circuit making a decision like a referee. I think that's why Verstappen partly didn't get a penalty in Austria. And I believe Leclerc partly did not get the penalty uh, because, you know, it was Monza. They're not going to give Charles Leclerc a penalty in this situation, even though, in my opinion, he did deserve to get a penalty nib. Um, I think you do disagree with me on this one and, you know, let people know, you know, why you disagree. Uh, yeah, I do disagree with uh, with you on this. We've we've had a few uh, discussions uh, about this um, already, but yeah, I'll explain why. Um, I think that you might not have noticed, but they started doing this actually in the Belgium Grand Prix. Um, there was a driver, I can't remember who, they also got the black and white flag for moving under braking as a warning. And if you do this again, you will get penalised. And I, I, I do like this rule because it means that drivers just can't, move under braking every single time and ultimately Leclerc yes he did move under braking that's why he got the black and white flag was it super super dangerous did he move across and forcibly move Hamilton off the track you know extremely dangerously where Hamilton actually had to break like we've seen with our Max Verstappen before you know where I don't know how Verstappen didn't get a penalty a couple of times by doing that um, but there you go. But I think it, it was a very hard, it was right on the edge. Um, at the end of the day, it, it was moving under the braking. And I think now with these rules that they've got in, you have to give it a black and white flag. Um, you know, it, it for, for what he did, I don't think it, it warrants a five second time penalty. Um, that's just my view. Um, I thought it was it was hard racing, super, super on the edge, because if he does it um, about 15 to 20 minutes later, Hamilton isn't actually forced off the track. He's forced onto the curb. Um, of course, that's not that's not me, um, you know, saying what Leclerc did was right. But I don't think that that sort of move warranted a five second time penalty. If it was more dangerous, um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, you know, perhaps in the future where it's bad, then yes, give a five second time penalty. But I, I don't, I don't, I just don't think it warranted a five second time penalty. Now I'll bring up two points that you can also um, answer as well. Um, there was, there was one thing that Michael Massey said that if there was contact, then he would have given Leclerc a penalty. Now I believe that's a very slippery slope because you can, let people get away with a lot if that is your definition of what is a penalty or not. Do you think that is a slippery slope? I think by that definition he gave, I think, you know, drivers are probably going to, you know, take more liberties. Do you think that? Well, I, I think he's saying that in, in, a, in a general sense. I don't think he's going to say that that's how they're actually going to look at it on a on a case by case basis you know say that you know a driver is completely forced off the track there's no contact that's a black and white flag you know if if it's dangerous and the and the driver is forced off the track completely then i think that they will give them a 5 second time penalty i think that michael massey there is just using that as a general sense of you know if that if that absolutely happens if there is absolute contact it's automatically a penalty do, do you get me with that? Yeah, I, I understand what he means, but you know, if if something dangerous does happen and that person gets a penalty, if that driver was to bring up, well, you said, you know, there needs to be, say, contact in that type of situation, then I just think it's a bit of a a slippery slope on that one. But I'll ask you also ask this, because I actually think the black and white flag in the long term is a bad thing. Because I think it gives drivers a second chance at doing stuff which is, in my opinion, either on the very edge or over the limit when it comes to defending or overtaking. Do you think that the drivers, kind of in a similar way to the previous point, but do you think the drivers 
will just be encouraged kind of slightly by a black and white flag that they you know they can get away with certain things a bit more um potentially and i do see where where you're sort of going with that um but i also think that the fia you know that sometimes they can be very harsh with their penalties and sometimes not it obviously depends on the stewards that they have involved but you know i i do see that some drivers will take advantage of it but i think that will be you know that won't happen too often because you know i don't think that we're actually going to see a black and white flag too often because for the most part the drivers are are very good in in their wheel to wheel racing and and quite fair um you know unless you're mainly kevin magnuson who do, who does <laughs> race quite hard um and i don't i don't actually mean that i think that that kevin magnuson actually is is um within reason for his actions on track most of the time so you know a, a slight dig a bit bit of a joke towards kevin magnuson there but nothing uh nothing actually too serious there um but i do understand what you mean with that i think that some drivers will look to take advantage of it but hopefully i and i do say hopefully that the fia don't allow uh the drivers to get away with it and i think that they will be aware of that and i think that they should they that they will probably clamp down on that quite hard if drivers do try to take advantage of it yeah <laughs> I just think, maybe not for every driver, I think some drivers will be a bit smarter about it, but I think with some drivers, if you give them, you know what I mean, if you give them a mile, they'll take a thousand. I think, you know, if if you gave a black and white flag to Max Verstappen for something that was probably worthy of a penalty, I don't think Max Verstappen or a Kevin Magnussen, as you said, you know, a hard, hard racer is going to be too dissuaded from doing that again. So we'll see how it gets on. As you said, I don't think it's going to be used every race, but I think eventually, say if it does get used a lot, I think eventually it will probably get removed because it will cause a bit of uh, a bit of havoc on the circuit. But now it's time to get into the tech update part of the video, and we're going to start off with Ferrari. We're going to look at Ferrari. Uh, Red Bull, Renault, McLaren, Alpha, Haas, Toro Rosso, Racing Point and Williams in this tech update. And I'm going to let Nib take us away with this one. So Nib, uh, have at it. Yes, so uh, the last tech update video we was we did was after the, uh, the German Grand Prix. So we do have uh, two, well, a couple of little things to catch up from Hungary, actually. Uh, since we there wasn't really enough from there wasn't enough upgrades from Hungary um, to warrant a separate video for Hungary, so uh, we've just included it in this. So first up, we have Ferrari, of course, who did bring a a barge board update to the Hungarian Grand Prix. Um, as you're looking at the image right there, that upper element of the barge board area, known as a boomerang wing, um, that was brought as an update for Ferrari, along with. Um, with a couple of extra elements there to guide the the airflow um, down towards the lower element of the side pod. And of course on the floor to just maximum downforce. And the drivers did say that they could feel that the car was better. Um, and there was certainly a performance gain um, on lower fuel. But obviously, as we know in the race, Ferrari did not do too well as they were uh, like, I think Leclerc was like 30 seconds off or was it even a minute? I can't remember, but um Next, moving to Racing Point, who brought a suspension upgrade um, to the Hungarian Grand Prix, as you can see there. They brought a new suspension, and that's just to allow them more performance um, in the lower speed corners. That, that had been an issue with them. They'd been really poor in the lower speed corners, and that's why they hadn't scored points um, very often after the first couple of races as the teams had the other midfield teams had were able to produce more performance out of the lower speed corners with their different suspension settings. So this was part two of their upgrade, which of course the first part they brought at the German Grand Prix and that there were more um, upgrades to come at the Belgium Grand Prix. And then just another shot of the front suspension there, of course, with everything else there at the front of the car. Very absolute beautiful picture there of how everything is so tight and and all tucked in there and make and when you have all the bodywork exposed like that and the front suspension there it does make you wonder how there aren't more failures on these cars 
more often than it is a testament to how reliable these cars are. But now just moving on to the picture of this Ferrari here at um, at Spa, as you can see, they're running a little bit of, um, well, they're running a new front wing. They're, uh, they're low drag front wing during um, the Belgium Grand Prix and also testing out their rear wing for what would be the Italian Grand Prix there, as we can see with Sebastian Vettel driving the Ferrari there. And, um, well, those up th those lag low drag um, performance certainly um, did help Ferrari, of course, at the Italian and Belgium Grand Prix. And then just a shot of the new mirrors that uh, Red Bull debuted at the Belgium Grand Prix there. Um, obviously, a lot of effort's gone into producing that mirror, and of course, it is all legal. And that's just, once again, to gather extra, extra downforce that they possibly can and just to channel the airflow there. And as you can see where you can actually see the mirror um, in the second shot, you can see the, how it's a curvatured downwards to try get it to then reattach just above to that bodywork, just above the side pod um, to get the air running over the top of the car down towards the diffuser in the back of the car. And now next, moving on to the racing point front wing, a big upgrade for them that arrived at the Belgium Grand Prix. And finally, the crocodile nose has gone. It is gone. I'm not sure if you guys had noticed, but it's gone after they debuted it in what was it? I think it was 2015 at the Hungarian Grand Prix. Racing Point, of course, Force India back then have gone away from their crocodile, crocodile nose, front wing, front nose cone, and gone towards a more traditional um, front wing, which we've seen from the likes of... Um, well, not so much Mercedes, this is more of a Ferrari, Red Bull sort of style um, front wing. Of course, uh, Mercedes run a much narrower front nose cone uh, than other teams, and that is displayed on that image. And then just moving on to the next image of the Williams rear wing. That is Williams' arm. Well, low drag rear wing, but not so low drag as we're about to see some other teams. Uh, most of these... Most of these um, images here is just displaying the team's low drag um, setups and and um, configurations that they had for these weekends. And of course, they're not going to be running at Singapore because if the teams were running uh, that skinny of a rear wing uh, during the Singaporean Grand Prix, they would, they'd have no tyres left by the end of the race. So yeah, that's just a display of the Williams rear wing there. And then next is the McLaren. You can see that the McLaren's rear wing is much more skinnier than the than the Williams rear wing there. And it just shows you that the teams that do have more money, of course, Williams do struggle for money, are able to perform better at races like this because they're able to produce items and um and and stuff like that. And just now moving on to the um onto the next shot of the Ferrari barge boards. It's just a better shot really of that upgrade that they brought to the barge boards at the um at the uh, Hungarian Grand Prix there. And then next, moving on to the Racing Point. Um, shot here at Spa with um, Sergio Perez driving there. And just a better illustration of their new rear wing. Oh, sorry, front wing, I should be saying. And as you can see there with the front wing, there's a lot more space um, towards the underside of the actual front wing. So a lot more air is traveling underneath the front wing down towards the barge boards. As you can see, it's not pushed all the way down on the end plate. It's about um, a quarter up the way of the end plate. And that's something that Red Bull really um, used well with their front wing upgrade at Austria. And they gained quite a lot of performance. And we've seen over the weekend at the Belgium Grand Prix that this upgrade probably brought Force, uh, Force India Racing Point probably about three to four tenths. So it was a really good upgrade there by Racing Point. And now, once again, in the last couple of races, they've been challenging for points, um, which is good to see. And then on to the second skinniest rear wing of uh, the whole entire, you know, Spa and Monza weekend is the is the uh, rear end, or the rear wing, I should rather say, of the Renault. And we've seen how monstrous actually Renault were in a straight line at Spa. You know, they were only a tenth off Ferrari, I think, in in, in the first sector in, in um in qualifying. So Renault were really quick in the straight line. And 
just massive credit to them, honestly. Um, and now just another shot here. We here we are to show what I'm talking about with um, Racing Point. Bye bye to the crocodile nose and hello to the non crocodile nose front wing. Sad to see it was a great piece of um, great piece of technology. Well, upgrade and just out of the box thinking by uh, Racing Point at the time, but it is no longer working it's not producing what they need for their car and um hello the new racing point front wing and now we go on to monza where we first look at the toro rosso front wing and on the lower end is the is the um so the yeah indeed the actual lower one is the monza spec uh front wing and the top is the actual normal front wing that they do run and as you can see on the bottom front wing here, it's more pointed up towards the absolute inside of that. And you might actually notice that the rear wing, the front wing, I should say, I don't know why I keep saying rear wing. I'm so used to talking about rear wings because that's what, you know, Spa and Munzer were all about was rear wings. As you can see, it's the front wing elements are more compressed, they're more flattened out. And that's just to eliminate the drag that the actual front wing um, does bring. Of course, it brings is mainly there, of course, for downfalls. But just to eliminate as much drag as possible. And now moving on to quite possibly the skinniest rear wing I've seen in quite some time is the rear wing of the Red Bull. It's quite remarkable how skinny that rear wing was. I'm sure um, some people had seen some shots of the red of the rear wing um, on the straights. And with the DRS flap open, it seemed like they didn't even have a rear wing on the car. It was absolutely ridiculous. And Sadly for Red Bull, of course, they had engine penalties, which means that they couldn't really show just how um, their true performance really. But um, certainly for Alexander Albon and Max Verstappen, and of course Albon again uh, during the Monza weekend, it helped in them overtaking numerous cars in the field. And then for Haas, they had a uh, rear wing upgrade and, well, spec for the italian grand prix and we've seen in the previous race this was really needed at spa they fell back through the field so massively um and if this up this up this rear wing spec was available for um for the belgium grand prix they would have been i think quite significantly better in the race but it certainly uh, it helped them a little bit more in during the italian grand prix but it was not to be but they also brought a little bit of a front wing um, upgrade for the uh, Italian Grand Prix there. And as you can see, just on the uh, near side of the image here, just where the flap adjuster is, uh, you can see how the front wing has a, has a bend in it. Um, the, the top element just has a bend just around near the flap adjuster. And that's once again just to just to eliminate the drag that the front wing is producing, but to still get the, the amount of downforce that they want, and that is required for the front wing to work properly. And then next is the McLaren um, rear wing here, as we, we looked at this previously, but they brought an even skinnier version of the rear wing here. And as you can see, I don't think they have a gurney flap on this. No, they don't, which is something that we're going to see um, from quite a few teams here coming up. So that was quite a, um, quite a good upgrade. And the gurney flap is just a little lining that edges along the end of the rear wing. Um, the main rear wing part there. Um, and of course, that just being there, that little edging, um, of course, creates drag because the air is hitting that. Um, and when that is not there, of course, um, there's less drag being produced. And then once again, another shot of the uh, of the Renault rear wing. And of course, as you can see, or as you can imagine, when that DRS flap opens up, it's almost as if there is no re rear wing there. So um, the Renault kudos to them really did produce a great and fantastic rear wing which brought them great results um in monza of course where they came fourth and fifth so kudos on to reno for that one and then just to another shot of the uh of the racing point here we have um well what has been dubbed as um just some turning veins really on the on the main on the main part of the chassis just where the bwt um logo is there we've seen we see mercedes also run re, run these we also see alfa romeo run quite similar um you know 
parts on the car there. So uh, Racing Point really have brought some upgrades over the last couple of races, and it has put them up the pecking order ever so slightly. And then next, and on to our final piece of our uh, tech update here for this video, is the Alfa Romeo rear wing, which they brought here to the Italian Grand Prix. And as you can see there, everything is all nice and smoothed out. And where the uh, the Swiss um, advertising is up the top, you can see there how the, there would usually be, and as you, and you'll look next time, I'll try to illustrate this in the next te tech update video, there's usually a lining, just a little edge where the... Um, just on the top of where that rear wing element is, and that is known as the gurney flap. And there is no gurney flap on this rear wing, and that's just to reduce the drag. I'll make sure I'll, up, I'll um, speak about this in the next tech video, just so that you you guys are more aware of exactly what I mean. But um, that is it for the tech update tech update video. Not actually much of a tech update, um, because it's just all of the uh, low drag specs. Um, and parts that teams run for Spa and Monza in particular. But of course, it was nice to see some actual upgrades, which will be staying on the car from Ferrari, um, Racing Point, and also uh, Red Bull. So that's going to wrap it up for the tech um, update video. Of course, uh, there, there won't be as many tech up the update videos um, towards the end of the season as the teams will stop bringing parts um, for the rest of the season. But, you know, if there is enough to cover for the Singapore, for the um, Singapore Grand Prix weekend, then we will bring you one. But um, if there is not, then I'm sure we'll bring you a new tech update video um, as soon as possible. Absolutely. And thanks, Nib, for doing that. That was great. And uh, yeah, we'll try and probably after I don't know, Singapore and Russia, we'll try and do something if there is enough updates that we've seen from the teams. I do know Racing Point um, are bringing... Uh, something quite big to Singapore, which is their last upgrade of 2019, basically. So we'll see what happens, and we'll see if we can do another uh, tech update type of thing. Again, thanks to Neb for doing that. But before we go, uh, let's quickly talk about Singapore. Now, I just need to let you guys know, for the next couple races, I am going to be taking this, uh, not the Singapore Grand Prix preview, but the previews in general are going to be separate from the podcast for a couple races and will be on a Thursday, the day before the race weekend actually gets underway. The re reason I'm doing that is because the views haven't been great as of late on the previews. and I, I want to see if, you know, it can be improved by moving it to a different day and maybe doing something different with it. So that's why we're doing that. Uh, so I'm going to save my thoughts as to Singapore uh, for then. But Nib... Basically, just, you know, give us a rundown for all the teams, a quick rundown of who you think will be good, not so good, and what are your predictions at the moment for uh, the Singapore Grand Prix? Um, right, so we'll we'll start with Mercedes, really. Um, I think that we'll probably see Mercedes dominance back again. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's just uh, Singapore, there's more corners. There's less straights. It's going to favor them more. And of course, even if Ferrari somehow managed to stick it on pole, um, Mercedes tire wear is so much better than, um, than you know, than Ferrari. I think that we'd see Mercedes comfortably get past the Ferraris. Um, indeed. So I think it will be um, as normal servers resumed um, at, at the Singaporean Grand Prix, if I'm perfectly honest. But who knows? They could come under threat from Red Bull, um, as Red Bull, of course, with um, Verstappen and potentially Albon, who's um, who's been pretty solid so far. It's been hard to tell because both drivers' weekends have been really uh, disrupted rather with, um, with Albon out in Q2 with the engine trouble. Um, and then, of course, Verstappen taking his penalties, vice versa. So that... This weekend, or this upcoming race, um, next weekend, indeed, uh, at Singapore, um, will be will be our first real true um, test of how Albon compares to um, to Verstappen. So that will be very interesting to see between those. Um, but of course, for Ferrari, you know, I think that they they just need to just need to get the best result that they are they possibly can get. Really, you know, I don't think that they're going to be um 
able to get a race win. Who knows? They still could get on the podium um, with more than likely Charles Leclerc because Leclerc really has been performing very well um, as of late. And not only the last two races, really since probably about Silverstone. Um, halfway through the season, Leclerc has really gone on a strong run. He's out-qualified Vettel, I think, the last seven races. And, you know, Vettel, at the end of the day, does have 60-odd poles or whatever it is in the sport. So it's very impressive for a driver in his second season in Formula 1 to uh, be dominating Sebastian um, over the last um, seven races like he is in qualifying. Um, But for Renault, um, as we now move on to the midfield, really, uh, I don't think that we're going to see, well, the same performance that we've just seen in Monza, because, of course, as they're going to put their high downforce um, spec on the car, bring their high downforce um, spec, you know, I, I don't think that they're going to be as good as what they were with their low drag um, spec. So I think it's going to be um, a bit bit of a disappointing uh, weekend from Renault coming up. But I think that is just... I think that what has influenced my view on that really is just how disappointing Renault has been. I hope they prove me wrong because, of course, at the end of the day, I am a Daniel Ricciardo fan, uh, being Australian, and I hope that Renault do do well. But, you know, there's, they've disappointed me so many times that I am just so pessimistic about them. So hopefully they prove me wrong, but I don't I, I don't think that they will, to be honest with you. Um and then with McLaren, I think that McLaren will be looking a little bit better, and I think they should be back at the top of the midfield um, as back to a bit of a more normal um, racing track. You know, we've seen at Spa and Monza, they haven't performed uh, fantastically. And I think even though I think we are seeing them drop off a little bit as they haven't been updating their car for quite some time now, I think since the French Grand Prix, um, but they are going to start falling back a little bit, but I still think that they're going to be very strong at the Singaporean Grand Prix. Um, then who who are the other teams I'm gonna say? Uh we'll we'll go on to uh we'll go on to Haas. Um well there's no point talking about Haas really. They're not gonna score points. Uh end of story. Um racing point. They have they have a decent chance, of course, as you mentioned, they're gonna bring an upgrade, another upgrade, which is great to see um to the Singaporean Grand Prix. And I think that they do have a chance of scoring points in this race. Uh, then on to Alfa Romeo, I think that they do also have some chance of scoring points, as they do for most races. Um, really, they have they have a pretty just sold sold race car, and you know maybe Giovinazzi can get some points. Who knows? I think it probably Kimi will um, if there is an Alfa to score points. Well, because Kimi's got more points than than Giovinazzi this season, it just kind of makes sense. Um, then of course we've got Toro Rosso. I think Toro Rosso will be pretty strong. Um, coming into the Singapore Grand Prix. We've seen them at straight tracks this year. They've been pretty strong. I remember Baku, they were, they were looking very good in qualifying. I don't think they did quite get the result. Um, of course, Singapore, very different track to Baku, but I think in high downforce tracks, um, Toro Rosso do perform pretty well. So expect to see Kvyat and Gasly performing better um, at Singapore. And then who else have we got? Have we got, we've got Williams. Um, I think they the might actually be a bit better than what they were in Monza and Spa at this track. And yeah, of course, uh, Russell will outperform Kibitza by about 15 seconds, as he usually <laughs> does. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think I've covered all the teams. I'm not very good at going off the top of my head through the teams, but um, I think that's probably what's going to happen uh, during the Singapore Grand Prix weekend. Yeah, I think you did. I think you did the best you could. Um, but yeah, I, I don't disagree massively with that. But uh, when it comes to my thoughts as to what's going to happen in Singapore for the Singapore Grand Prix, make sure to check out my preview for said race coming out next Thursday at 12pm UK time. But guys, that is it for the podcast today. You know, looking at the FIA's inconsistencies, the tech update and a mini preview for Singapore. Thank you guys for coming along and watching. As always, great to have you watching, of course, and interacting in the comments, which I'm sure you are. Nib, thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll see you, of course, for the race watch along for Singapore, where hopefully uh, we'll have those mic levels sorted out, which were a bit uh, bad, of course, for Italy. 
Yes, and uh, of course, thanks for having me on the podcast as usual. And of course, I do apologize for the for the mic issues that I seemingly have. I don't know why I am quiet. I am literally about a, a not about half a hand away from my microphone. So I don't know why it sounds like I'm in another room, even though it definitely doesn't to me. Uh, but hopefully those mic those mic levels are a bit better so that you can hear me properly. Um, yes. Yeah, so of course, thanks for having me on, and thanks for uh, everyone to listen to me incoherently ramble on about the uh, about the Singapore preview there. Yep, no problem. And um, yeah, the mic levels. I think it's I think it's on my end. But what I'm going to do, uh, just to let people know, is I'm going to turn my mic levels down so. During the race watch and when Nib comes on, we are at a more similar level. So when you do turn up the volume, you know, Nib and me are at a similar-ish level. So I don't come through too loud and he comes through too quiet. We come through at the same level. That's what I'm going to try and do. And hopefully we can achieve that for the Singapore race watch along. But guys, thank you for coming along. Just want to say uh, there is another video coming out before the Singapore Grand Prix weekend gets underway. And that is... A video on Monday where I'm going to look at Sebastian Vettel and, well, what is going wrong and what I see for his future. And it's not a great future, in my opinion, for Sebastian. So I'll do a video on that on Monday, coming out at 12pm UK time. And as I said, we'll have the Singapore Grand Prix preview um, on Thursday. And then, of course, the Singapore Grand Prix weekend. And then the Russian Grand Prix weekend is a week after that. Make sure, guys... Again, to comment down below what you thought of this video and what you think of what we talked about. Also, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this as we do a podcast episode basically once a week. Um, as well, like this video if you want to see the content continue and it really does help out the channel if you do do so. And by the way, when it comes to subscribing, uh, bottom right of the screen, you can do it right there or just go to my homepage, subscribe and hit the notifications bell. Don't forget to join us on Discord. The Discord server is in the link below in the description. That's the best place for notifications of my videos and streams. So make sure to join that. And also like my Facebook if you can. It's ChazRHDF1 on Facebook. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Chaz6110. And check out my website ChazRHD.com for more content like this but guys until monday and until the singapore grand prix preview and the singapore grand prix weekend it has been me chazer hd goodbye